Hello everyone, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a compiler specialist, I'm a PhD student in uh, cybersecurity. I'm working in security of embedded systems and I'm going to talk about the use of OLVM to uh, generate secure code that are, that are secure against uh, some attacks that target embedded systems. So uh, let me contextualize the subject first. Um, as you may know, uh, embedded system is now part of our daily life, our every day, from smart card, credit card, passport, etc. And physical attacks are probably uh, one of the major threats against these systems, because even uh, against a, a strong crypt cryptographic algorithm that are mathematically secure and proven, they may be uh, vulnerable to such uh, attacks. And what is it? Uh, they are of two categories. We have safe channel attacks that consist of uh, analyzing the circuits and try to find what have been executed, what have been done, what data have been manipulated inside the circuit uh, based on information that can be uh, retrieved from out that outside the device, such as uh, the acoustic signal, the, the, the execution time, the power consumption, and electromagnetic emanation. And the second category is uh, fault injection attack that consists of uh, injecting a fault to disturb the normal functioning of the device and by means of uh, several other tools such as a laser or uh, disturbing the clock signal also known as a, a clock glitch or injecting electromagnetic beams uh, in order to exploit these uh, disturbance to to extract information or to make the circuit do uh, some unexpected uh, operations. And these attacks uh, mainly uh, aim to, uh, to obtain sensitive data such as cryptographic keys, or uh, to bypass protections, or to make hardware reverse engineering. Um, and due to the type of data uh, this system have to manipulate, such as uh, personal data, uh, confidential data and even sometimes critical data. The security of this system is a, is, a, is a major concern for both industrial and state organizations. And our work consists of generating code that is secure against these, these attacks. Well, actually in the state of the art there are already uh, some existing uh, countermeasure against this system, against these attacks. But if you take a look on a, um, the code transformation flow from source to the binary code, uh, experts in this field uh, usually apply the security at the source code level. Uh, the problem is the compiler may optimize this code and we cannot be sure that the security uh, will be intact at the binary code. Because most of the time, the security consists of trying to break the dependency between what is executed inside the circuit and information that can be retrieved outside the circuit, such as uh, electromagnetic emanation, and that by trying to obfuscate the code, trying to insert dummy instruction, trying to uh, redundant, uh, trying to insert redundant execution, or try to mask some data inside the circuit, and all these uh, security uh, properties can be easily removed by compilers. Um, in the state of R, you'll find uh, most of the time per uh, auto that uh, uh, suggests to remove uh, to, to compile with minus uh, O or zero. Uh, in order to avoid uh, optimizations, um, and as consequence, that will increase uh, drastically the overhead of the execution. Um, the second approach is the assembly approach, and the problem of this approach is, since we have many transformations to do in order to implement the count measure, we lack semantic in semantic information. Um, and it makes the code transformation a bit harder and will increase the execution uh, time and uh, code size. And in this uh, work, we, we're trying to explore the use of um, compiler uh, against these attacks, these embedded attacks, um, with the advantage of having the uh, possibility to control some optimizer, we can put our account measure in the right, in the right place before or after some specific optimizer. Um, also, we have a benefit to have some code transformation opportunities uh, inside the compiler, and all these uh, uh, advantages allow us to reduce the, cut, uh, the security overhead. And the second motivation is, uh, if you take a look at the state of the R, most of the time, an attack is designed, a countermeasure is designed to protect against a single attack. 
and in real life, uh, the attacker is not uh, restricted in a single attack. So uh, when it comes to, uh, to protect against several attacks, uh, they are manually and naively increment, uh, incre increment, uh, superposed. The problem is, uh, it has been uh, demonstrated in state of the art that sometimes when you superpose a uh, countermeasure of different kind, uh, the code may be uh, less secure than uh, the protected one. And that's why our approach is instead of uh, superposing a naively uh, a countermeasure, we try to combine them. And for that, we use the compiler to uh, generate this code. So, um, I talked about uh, many ki uh, different kind of attacks. Uh, due to the time I have here, I'm going to focus on fault injection attacks. Um, I'm going to present uh, here what we've done in this topic. So we can talk about fault b before uh, 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 precising what kind of fault we're talking about. Uh, actually, uh, a fault may occur at different levels of software or hardware, from algorithm to uh, to register, trans tra transistor, etc. So in this, uh, in this work, we are focusing on fault that impact instruction. For example, laser that uh, try to uh, impact a single instruction or uh, a range of instruction. Actually, we talk about the fault that is the, that is the replacement, the default model that is uh, instruction replacement. And that consists of replacing the existing instruction into other instruction. So uh, if the replacement is uh, if the instruction is replaced by a knob or something equivalent, for example, an instruction that has nothing, that doesn't change the state of the program, we talk about, uh, we observe uh, an instruction skip, and the count measure is to redundant execution, so that if one of them is uh, skipped, the second one will be executed. And the second model is uh, when the instruction is replaced by a jump-like instruction, uh, we talk about the control flow hijacking, and the count measure is control for integrity. Um, well, in our implementation, we, uh, we resist against several attacks, uh, multiple fault injection. We have tried in our lab multiple fault injection um, for that, that fault that uh, keep a, a range of instruction. And uh, our compiler just uh, uh, take as argument two parameters, the number of instruction that an attacker is able to skip and the generated code automatically resists against that uh, model of attacks. Um, and here I'm going to uh, talk about the redundancy to explain a little bit how we, uh, our, the, the compiler helped us to, to increase the security and to reduce the, or the cost of the, uh, the execution. So uh, the instruction redundancy consists of duplicating instructions so that if one of them is faulted or uh, uh, impacted, the second executes uh, uh, correctly. So the scheme, uh, the tolerance scheme we implemented inside the compiler is if we take, if we take a set of instructions, uh, for each instruction inside, a, such as the assembly code or the source code, we try to see is the instruction is idempotent. Idempotent instruction is an instruction that we can execute several times, uh, providing always the same results. And if it is the case, so we duplicate the instruction twice, three times, or etc. Uh, if it's not the case, we try to transform it into an uh, idempotent form and then duplicate it. So this is the general uh, scheme. So let's, uh, let me show you how this scheme is implemented at the assembly uh, approach. Uh, if you take uh, an ARM instruction at R0, R1, R2, this is an idempotent instruction and you, uh, you can trivially duplicate it in such a way. But if you take the, this uh, instruction, R1, R1, R0, this is not idempotent because it's a kind of incrementation. So you cannot uh, uh, duplicate it in such a way. So uh, several transformations have been proposed in the state of the art uh, that consists of uh, uh, trying to convert single instruction into set of instructions that are idempotent that can be executed whenever a number of execution we want. And then to duplicate this instruction. So here you, you can see that uh, we are from one instruction, we go uh, to times four instruction. 
And the problem is uh, how to find an extra register when we are at the assembly code level. And several propositions in the state of the art, for example, Berengi proposed to uh, know exactly how many registers you want to use uh, in your algorithm. And some other proposition is to use the scratch register, but the problem is we cannot use this register all the time. And, and, the prob and if we need several transformation, we cannot always uh, uh, found free register. And the overhead is uh, the most important impact in, by, uh, in this uh, approach. We are times four, and some authors reported times 14 for transforming only one instruction. So I'll let you imagine the impact in terms of, of code execution. So what we propose here is to use the old VM to generate code to try to transform instruction uh, inside the compiler to try to generate instruction that does not need, that don't need to be transformed. So here is a representation of our compiler. Uh, black boxes are passes we introduced and, and gray boxes or passes uh, we are slightly modified. Um, so I'm not going to explain uh, what we've done inside our each box here. I'm gonna pick some of them, uh, such as uh, ISL pass, ISL set of passes. So what we did here is to try to generate uh, the, if possible, um, is the idempotent instruction. We try to maximize the number of idempotent instruction we generate so that the instruction no longer need to be uh, transformed later. For example, if you take a look at this instruction, uh, by default, ARM generates MLA, multiply, and accumulate. That is not idempotent. Instead, we force the generation of two idempotent instruction, MLA and ADS instruction. And the second, um, the second uh, modification is the register location. Here, what we've done is to try to have different register for uh, allocated for the source and destination registers. And instead of having uh, R0, R0, R1 allocated, we have something like this, where all registers, where source registers are different to destination register. And this avoid us to transform, to have a, a very long transformation after the code is generated. So the idea is instead of transforming instruction after they have been generated, we generate instruction that, doesn't, that don't need to be transformed. Uh, and the duplication is uh, straightforward. And, but the problem is all instruction cannot be uh, transformed into idempotent form in this way. So we have uh, uh, transformation passes. I think we have four or five transformation passes. That, that, uh, their role is to, to handle those instructions that can't be transformed by just uh, modifying the instruction selection and the register allocation. For example, the BL elimination, because if you has the, have this example BL, is the function call of armor uh, instructions. Uh, we cannot duplicate DL, we cannot call twice a function. We have to be conservative. We, we, we have to call only once uh, the function. So how we can duplicate the function call while guaranteeing that only one of them is uh, called. So the trick we use here is to convert BL into B. The problem is B doesn't save uh, uh, the, the return address. So we made it manually before. So we, we create a basic block just before, uh, just after the BL instruction, and we, uh, we save the return address. The second instruction uh, is to comply with a thumb uh, instruction call, where the first byte, the byte zero, have to be uh, at one. And this pass, uh, at this point, our instruction must be all idempotent, so uh, we naturally uh, duplicate them here. And we, did, we, we duplicate instruction just before the instruction scheduling to have the advantage of uh, uh, the instruction uh, duplicated also, the, the duplicated instruction also uh, scheduled, as you can see in the second graph here. So there are two advantages. The first one is performance and security that maybe I will, won't have time to explain here because uh, the, the, the schedule layer allow us to, to create a distance between a uh, instruction that uh, allow us to, to combine with other countermeasures uh, that uh, exist in the state of the R. So that's why we created an uh, instruction uh, separation pass here that uh, are responsible to, to uh, leave several uh, distance between instruction. So I'm going to conclude. 
I didn't have time to. <laughs> wow. We do have time for a few questions. Time. Someone If, if, uh, if an instruction uh, changes uh, even one bit of the, the program state, we consider it as non idempotent. But then is additional idempotent? Yeah, it depends. It depends on, uh, yeah, the addition uh, can be idempotent if it changes the program state. And can on, okay, okay. here I'm talking about uh, addition that are idempotent. And are you, um, how, how do you evaluate the scheme works? Yeah, I didn't have time to present the, the experimentation, but yeah, we evaluated uh, in terms of performance. Uh, we are better than, uh, we had times uh, 20, around 22% better than uh, the assembly approach. And in terms of security, uh, we evaluated in our lab and we resisted against the uh, attacks we, uh, we claim to resist against. Thank you. We might have time for one more question. So you didn't understand. Do you check that the call function is done by the Because recent right measures you get. Uh I'm sorry, I didn't really get the question maybe. Uh, function call, we, when we duplicate, we, we try to, to uh, only execute one time the function if we duplicate it. And this is the tricks I show, uh, maybe not really understood, but uh, we have the tricks to only execute one time the function uh, inside the, the execution. That's all, thank you.